I'm, I'm asking him to give me something with some spiritual substance to it that will bless, encourage, feed. And if he doesn't do that or if I fail to align myself or, or falter somewhere, you know, it's not his fault, it's mine. And uh, so I thought and I studied and I thought, I can't get away from this thought and it don't make a lot of good sense. To me. I don't know, Brother Tom, have you ever done that? Oh, yeah. you, and finally, you just got up and done it and let it, you know. And, uh, well, see, I've sat out there before, and I, I've heard folks say, well, I got into preacher day. You know, sometimes he preaches good, but this wasn't worth five cents. Wasn't worth coming out for. So I'm hoping that you're not able to say nothing like that. If God will help me, let's pray again. Father. In the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. How great. Lord, we just want to pause a moment and say from the depths of our heart that we are thankful that it's mine. That you're ours. You belong to us. You're our loving Savior, King, Redeemer, great High Priest. Oh, bless your name. Hallelujah. God we look to you this morning. These are your people and your sheep. And whoever may listen to the video afterwards. God may it not just be a bunch of human thoughts running together. But may it be something coming alive. Anointed by the spirit of God and full of the life of God. That will give us a message we can apply to our heart. Feed our spiritual man and bless us and lift us up. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for your help just now. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to talk to you for just a few moments. And, and let me say, it's always my honor, my privilege to be here. I honestly feel greater liberty here than I do in a lot of some other places. But I appreciate that. I want to talk to you about something that you know so well. You've heard numerous times. I don't know if I'm the only one. Don't lift your hand up when I ask you that. But do any of you get bored hearing the same old story? Oh, my stars, I've heard that a hundred times. Did, did you all sit maybe down to Steve's barber shop or something like that? I've heard him tell that a hundred times. Well, it's going to be a hundred and one. I would hope that the stories of the Bible, regardless of the fact that we've heard them from our childhood up, I would hope that they would never come to a point where they bored us. May the blessing given by this, because this is God's word and it's full of life and blessing. The blessings are ceaseless. They're unending. And like one song, I believe it was that quartet called the uh, Gold City, I think was one they used to hear. I heard it years ago. They sung a song and they said, I think I'll read it again and let it bless my soul. You know, uh, is it, I've heard that before. Well, I want to hear it again. It don't grow old to me. So we're going to talk about Noah's Ark just a little bit this morning. And I want to leave you with a thought. Go to Matthew 24. You are so familiar with this scripture that maybe this will help you memorize it. This is not some dull, boring child story. There is, there is depth in this. There is deep spiritual meaning in this. This is what is known as the Olivet Discourse. Jesus was asked two questions. When are these things going to be? You're talking about the destruction of the temple. And what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of this age? And he addressed both of those, I believe. And he gets down here to verse 37. And he said, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now I want to ask you something. What's wrong with getting married? What's wrong with eating something? What's, what's wrong with, with those things like that? 
what I get from this verse, and we're going to read on just a moment, what I get from that is life was just going on as usual. They were just going on daily like it always did. And in verse 39, this is the kicker, and knew not, or in my reference here it says, and they didn't realize it. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, we're going to read another scripture, but think on this just a moment. These people were oblivious to what was taking place. They could not recognize God at work, although He was very much at work. God had sent His plan. It seemed to be ridiculous to the, to the natural man. Too simple to grasp a hold of. Things that they had never heard of before. The Bible said they didn't know it. They were not aware of it until it happened. Now here's the sad part about that. When it did happen, then they became fully aware of what was going on. But, oh, this should sober our hearts. Too late at that point. It's too late. How sad the thought that it's too late. Now let us go on and read over here in, in uh, Hebrews 11 about Noah. And then we'll try to get into this thought just a little further. And, and I want to just sort of exhort you this morning. Encourage you. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things, listen to that, not seen as yet, moved with fear. There was something motivated this man. He had heard from God about something the natural eye couldn't see or get a hold of. It was in an unseen realm and could only be perceived or seen by an eye of faith. Have you heard that song, There's a land that is fairer than day? How do you know it is? Have you ever seen it? Yep, I've seen it. When? How did you? What? I didn't see it with these eyes. By eyes of faith I see it. Because it's unseen to the natural. The scientist's mind, the most brilliant minds in this world cannot perceive of its reality. They can't, their education, whatever, that may be good. I'm not down on the discoveries made by science and, and, and the minds of these men. But that will not be able to grasp that which is unseen, but yet is eternal. And the things that are seen are temporary. It said he was moved with fear. He prepared an ark. What for? To the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now as I said, we're going to stop reading right there for a bit. This is not a real deep message from the book of Revelation or nothing like that. We are all familiar with the story and the, what tells us in Genesis that the earth was full of violence. That it had so gotten so corrupt that God said, I, I've got to do something about this. And He sent a flood and destroyed every living thing on the face of this planet. And there were eight souls that were saved out of that great, uh, that great flood. And those were Noah and his house. How were they saved? Because they had prepared an ark according to instructions given by the Almighty. And when they entered that ark, they were safe from certain destruction that was outside. Very simple, isn't it? But God's still speaking to us through that. Now, for a moment... We talk about the saving of Noah and, and the people and we know that you and I in order to be saved from the wrath to come we have to enter the ark. 
It's not an ark made of natural wood, but it's a spiritual ark, and that is Christ Jesus. The only place where there is safety from a storm that is absolutely coming. It's going to arrive one day. Now, listen, those people maybe couldn't fathom that. Or they may have said, I've heard that for years now. There may be people out here that, oh, yeah, I know. And honestly, even many of God's people have gotten to a place where they wander. I've talked to some. I wonder if the Lord's ever going to come because by our reckoning of things and events that have transpired on the world scene, we would have thought He would have been here by now. But He hadn't quite made it yet. But still, even though it seems like a day of reckoning and a day of judgment will not come, it is absolutely certain to come. Even if death comes, after death there's the judgment, the Bible says. It's appointed unto man to die, and after that the judgment. Now, the only safe place that I can be that assures me to escape certain wrath that has been pronounced by God a day when God will pour out His wrath on this earth. Yes. Usually when you speak of this, it's not very well received in a lot of places because they don't like to hear negative preaching, as they call it. We want to hear something that will make us bubble up and feel good. We want to have a sensation or something we can leave out and feel nice about. And those are not pleasant thoughts, especially when many of us have got relatives and acquaintances that if that day were to come today, they would receive the wrath instead of the escape from the wrath. So it's not a pleasant thought. But mark my word, it's not because I said it. It's because God's unfailing, undying, everlasting Word has declared that day would arrive sometime when I don't know. And there is only one place of escape from certain destruction that will come on all who are outside of this place of safety, and that is in Jesus Christ. You don't get in Jesus Christ because mom and dad was in Jesus Christ. You don't get in it because you've been a faithful member of a church. And I'll say this, even though I'm not totally opposed to this idea, you're not going to get in it by reading a prayer off of the back of a card and signing your name on some membership roll. You're not going to get in it by doing a whole bunch of good works and giving money to the poor or to the church. You can only get in Christ by one Spirit. Are we all baptized into Christ? By the Holy Ghost. I'm a, I'm a member of the Hall family. And I did not get into the Hall family by joining it. I was born into the Hall family. And you must receive a new birth. You must be born again to be in Christ. This is a supernatural work of the Holy Ghost that's done by the sovereignty of God. Amen. Now, we all know that. You're, every one of us, is, we, we know that. <clears throat> I want us to look at the other side. And I'd like to do something that may be considered a little strange by you. But I'd like to, what would be the proper way of saying it? Borrow your imagination. I would like for you to let your mind drift and go along with me and let us take a journey in our minds. What I'm fixing to suggest is not some wild, wacky fairy tale, <laughs> some wild dream that never existed. I'd like for you and I to go back that day and let us try for just a moment to imagine what went on in the hearts and the minds of those people that were not on that ark? What good's that going to do? I think we should do it. Just follow with me and we'll see where the Lord takes this. You and I know that it's going to rain and flood the whole earth was something that seemed totally far out and far-fetched. Some men never heard of, never seen of, nothing. But what you know, sky's nuts. And not only that, here is Noah, 
Now you don't know him too personally, but your dad done a little work with him at one time or somebody else worked for him or something or another or they knew him uh, down on the street or something, used to meet and talk with him in the coffee shop or whatever. And you run into him once and said, hello, how are you doing and, and all like that. Knew him like that, but you didn't know him. Now all of a sudden he's building this humongous object and he says it's going to house animals and his family because there's a great judgment coming that will take away all life on the face of the planet. Would you not perhaps squint your eye just a little bit and, and, and think maybe Noah drank too much of that bad stuff down there at that one corner store and it's affected his mind or something? What would you think of Noah? Now, him a saying that, why should I believe Noah? Why in this world should I believe such a ridiculous message from a guy that seems no different than any of the rest of us? He, he doesn't possess any special talents or abilities that are above the natural man. He, he doesn't walk around with a halo around his head. He's not able to wave his hand and do big miracles and cause mountains to disappear and all that. Hold on, I'll show you I'm a God and just speak a word and fire drop and burn the whole place up or something. He, none of that. He just has a message that he's preaching. Why should I believe him? Well, God spoke to him. How do I know God spoke to him? You're asking me to put all my trust into some lunatic message that sounds far-fetched into a guy that's displaying no more than the rest of other. You know, he does live a little right, maybe. Why should I believe him? What is there about Noah that I should believe this thing that there is a great deluge coming? There's really not anything that I can see from a human standpoint that would make you believe it. Why did he do it? By faith. Faith that comes from God. Faith that only God... You can't receive anything except it be given to you from above. Now, let us right now just go back for a moment and let us, I want you to take your mind and let's go back. You just got out of bed and you're off work today. So you're going to go down and visit some of the other family members or some of your friends. Or you've got an outing plan. Or you're getting up and there's a promotion waiting on you at work and you can't wait to get there. Or you just had one awful good party last night and you're going to have another one tonight. Or you're putting the final touches on this new home that you, you're building. And, and so you're just getting ready to go on with life. And Or maybe perhaps one of your relatives are sick and they're down being treated by the doctor or whatever and you're all burdened down by that and you're griping and complaining or whatever and you've got to run to the store... Life in general, in other words, is going on. Morning don't look no different. Nothing seems to be out of the way. What about that guy out there? He got a bunch of animals in it. I, I don't know about that. You know, why should I? You know, there, we never heard tell of such a thing. And he's sitting out there. I guess when he gets hot enough, he'll come back out or else he'll suffocate in there, one or two. But then all of a sudden, little drops of rain began to hit. The fountains of the deep break up. Waters began rising. Your plans for whatever they might be, whether it be a nice day at the beach, a final touch on a new house, some promotion, a business deal going down, or traveling here, going on a vacation, that all gets interrupted. It all gets stopped. Now, folks, this may not seem to do, but you need to give it some thought. You're back there. All of a sudden, waters begin to rise. Your life now becomes not just sitting there scratching your head and wondering, what in the world is this? You are now being threatened that you've got to get out of here. You're, but this is my house. It's going to be washed away. You must move to higher ground. This stuff is raising up. There's already cattle and people floating. There's already some dead bodies afloat. You now become concerned for your life. One thing and one thing only is on your mind, and that's survival. 
you now hasten and you head to higher ground hoping this water will stop. But it just comes from and just pelts rain and comes down in bucket pools and the whole earth around you is being engulfed. You are hearing the shrieks and the cries and the screams of all kinds of people. You're seeing a, a, a mother with her baby. You know, you say, that did, that did too happen. Everything was destroyed outside of that ark. You don't think some people had babies? Some of them was holding to their wife and trying to struggle and get them out of this. All of a sudden, all of those plans went. They don't exist no more. Your one thought is, I'm going to die if I don't do something. And the reality hits you. Dear Lord, he was right. It hits you now that God has intervened in the affairs of human life. He's now stepped out of eternity into time. And he's doing something. And show me the one that can now put a stop to it. <clears throat> there are not enough prayers that will put a stop to that. Summon all the holy men together. Get all the clergymen, those that explained away the word of God. Folks, I'm going to share something with you here in a minute. But I heard the other night some of the worst blasphemy coming from clergymen. It's not my place to condemn or, or, or anything like that or judge. But at the same time, to stand up and say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was just a spiritual thing. You just destroyed the whole Christian faith when you done that. Because if there's no resurrection, Paul said, then your faith is in vain. You're still in your sins and your loved ones have perished in the ground. That's right. That's right. And you've got clergymen, prominent people in places that teach such a thing as that. And what's worse, there are flocks of people that embrace it because it comes from somebody that they feel like knows a lot more than what they do. You can't get all enough of them together to stop this rain. The mother screams. All of a sudden you see men and their countenance differs. You see some horrified. Their absolutely fear has consumed them. Panic. They're panic stricken. They don't know where to turn. They can't get in that ark now. Door shut. You can't get in it. Even if you could get to it and you can't, the waters have rose too much. Others are not horrified. You see them with their fists clenched, cursing God and swearing at Him. They're full of anger and bitterness. Why? Because He has disrupted their life. They had big plans and that's all been interrupted. Not only that, with what they're seeing, they will never be accomplished. They are about to perish and go down in destruction and experience death and they will never be able to accomplish that which they purpose to do in their hearts. All of their dreams, all of their ambitions. Now folks, this may not sound like much, but these are sobering words because we stand at the door and the possibility of the great day of God's wrath it is, can't be too far off in my estimation, but then what do I know? When God looks down upon this scene out here and sees that men can no longer be controlled by reason, you can't reason with them. You can't be able to, you, you can't talk or persuade them. The apostasy runs deep. And you cannot preach a sermon that will cause people to see. I, I've, I've had them. I, folks, I, I have had them. Pardon me for getting a little beside of myself, but this is the what I feel in my spirit this morning. I have went to churches where they, and I got up and preached a sermon or something different than this. And they, oh, God sent you here. We need a pastor like you. And before long, they all, oh, yeah, they, 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 you know. And then after a while, I say, I love you. And it's because that I love you that I want to tell you I see something in going on in this congregation and in your life personally that's hindering you in your walk with the Lord. It is not acceptable with Him. He will not tolerate it. I also see something that's went on in this church 
for 75 years and that's why you're bearing no fruit. Your older members are dying off. You're sitting around wondering why we have no impact on the world. And so in order to try to gain more people to come to the church so you can keep the church going by replenishing it with younger members because older ones are gone, you resort to all kinds of silly tactics and the Bible does not ordain or authorize the use of any of it. And yet we've got this insane idea that it might could just work. Probably will. We'll just do this. I've seen everything from motorcycles running down the middle of the aisle to clowns on bicycles tooting their horn to rodeos. I know of one church. And there's, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with having a fish fry. Nothing wrong with having that. Have one. I'll be there and I'll eat some of the fish. But when churches engage in all kind of activity like that as a way to try to draw, they've lost sight forevermore of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, if I be exalted, I go by yards, and they'll have signs, or there's advertisement, come to so-and-so church. Come on down to so-and-so or people. I'm the pastor, so come on down to our church. You're going to find wonderful things there and everything. It's all about exalting my church. I'm here to tell you I'm not into none of that. Exalting a church won't help nobody. Telling people about Jesus Christ. Nowhere did Jesus say, go into all the world, build some beautiful buildings, and, and figure out some programs to get people to come to that church. He said, you go out there and make disciples. Amen. You go out there and do it. And folks, salvation by the gospel is the only thing that will save these desperate individuals I'm describing. It was too late then. There were those that as their hands were fighting, trying to grasp air, the water up over their head, with their last breath, they blasphemed the name of God and cussed Him for what He was doing. Oh, I don't think they're doing that. You better read the book of Revelation. The Bible talks about horrendous judgments in two places. And it said men still wouldn't repent and they still blasphemed the name of God. Horrendous, major, great, big judgments hit the planet. And it's just saying, that, boys, we need to pray. It was... Yeah. Leave us alone. Leave us alone. You think that's not buried somewhere in the de depths of men and women's hearts today? It is. How do I know it? Because they'll spend $40 million to get a plaque took off of a wall of a public place that has the Ten Commandments on it. Those people, I can't imagine. Could you imagine what was going through their minds as the waters was raising? Certain destruction was upon them. They already was looking at destruction all around them. Dead people already. Some of their neighbors, friends, and they're scrambling for higher ground trying to get their kids up. Oh, one drop. The waters rush them away. They're gone. The confusion, the panic, the fear, the absolute horrible fear and the bitterness that consumed others. I had my life planned and you come along and disrupted it. All kinds of feelings. And when it was all over with, all of the blasphemers, all of the people who may have been some of them good moral people, but they sought their own instead of the things of Christ. They may be thought that there's a lot of folks that include Jesus in their life, but he's just sort of a sideline thing. You know, we, we, we got that base covered in case we die. He's a good insurance policy. No relationship. The songs we sung. I belong to Jesus. He belongs to me. He becomes everything. Anything short of that, I ain't got much use for it. And neither does He. Now, place yourself on those people outside the ark and just imagine what they felt. Just a little of it. Now, with that, go over here to this scripture we all know well in Revelation chapter 6. And 
And as far as I know, everybody here is a Christian, and I'm not going to insinuate that you're not. But I've, I know you've often heard, don't let anybody make you doubt your salvation. That's good advice. But the same token, I've heard Brother Tom preach on it. What's it say, Brother Tom, about your election? Sure. Make your election sure. Make sure of it. The Apostle Paul said you need to examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. Don't ever doubt your salvation. That's fine. Don't doubt it. But don't get so cocky and arrogant. And sure, I've talked to people. They are. I just sent a young man a message. Young man. Foolish young man. Very foolish. He calls out the name of a church. All you people go to this church. Said, you know you ought to know what they teach. They teach this and they teach that. And, they, and you know, I go down here to so-and-so Baptist church and we don't have none of that stuff down there. And, and uh, you know, and he began calling names like that. I just put on there and I said, son, I, I was a member of the Pentecostal movement since 1972 and it's true. The movement as a whole has begun promoting ideas and doctrines and things that I think are repulsive. They've, they've entered into some stuff that I cannot agree with. But there's not no need. There's not no need in me pointing a finger of criticism at some when others are doing things just as bad. When they got a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. There's, 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 you can't box one group of people in and say, it's out there, it's everywhere except right here. We don't have it. We have to do as Paul said. I've seen people get so cocky sure of themselves that they're living in open rebellion to the Word of God themselves while criticizing others for doing Look at that bunch. Look at what they're doing. What are you doing? Oh, well, we don't have this around here. And they'll stand there and tell a vulgar, filthy joke in a minute and laugh about it. But I'm protected because I'm under this covering of the only group that teaches it right. Oh, is that right or not? Now, do you all settle down. I know I about got you ready to shout with all this, but hopefully it'll end on a positive note here. I'm trying to show you the seriousness of it. There are people that are so sure of themselves and what they teach does not line up with the Scriptures. Oh, it may in one place. They line up with it here. I pastored a church in Kentucky. I, what do you all believe? Brother, we believe this right here from cover to cover. That's our... Oh, okay. So I get up and preach something out of... Oh, well, now, now, now that, that we, uh, we, we don't believe like that. Well, it's right there. I just read it to you. Well, that's not how we see it, and that's not what that means. So in other words, God has just made a whole bunch of statements and don't really mean anything, and He leaves it up to us to decipher.